tight are now literally drinking, kicking back, and just talking normal. You know, when you actually get stuff done. That's what. Pull a stick out of your ass, and it's amazing what happens. Mm -hmm. And Adam shows up, and it's a party. (laughs) Following his lead. Hey guys, <laughs> uh, just give me a sound check there. Hey, what's going on? What did you have for dinner last night? I have no idea. <laughs> really? Okay. I used to ask people, hey, what did you have for breakfast? And nobody eats breakfast anymore. It's like, at all, it's bad. But yeah, My breakfast was lunch. Pretty much. Oh, I had the functionized uh, coffee for breakfast around like 10. Yeah, that's about what I had around 11. Yeah. Coffee for breakfast. There we go. Uh, Ghee gee and coffee. It's delicious. Whenever you're ready. You ready? I'm ready. All right. Do you have time? In general, yes. In general, yes. Great. <laughs> Do you have time typically to work out? Uh, I have to very much make the time to work out. Exactly. And who really has time to work out? Not these guys. Right. In general, would you agree that the working population has passed the prime in working out? Those days of going to the gym all day, every day, are pretty much gone because you're working in and out all day, every day, grinding it from early morning to late at night? Or if not, you've got the kids, the activities, everything gets you busy, and then you really have to make health or anything of that type a priority. So yeah, it's pretty darn difficult at times. What if I told you in only 15 minutes or less, you can get the most cutting edge, scientific, proven, backed, time and time again, workout. I know what you want to say, so I don't believe it, because I've never <laughs> been there and tried it myself. But it really is amazing. Go ahead and let's see. Exactly. It. So the mm-hmm. Fit Lab at Functionized and Integrative Therapeutics is just that. In and out, 15 minutes or less, once a week. It sounds too good to be true. I know my dad said, don't tell anybody about this, but I got to tell everyone about this because this place is awesome. It's what I do. Share the secrets. Let them out. Come on in, www.functionized.com. Change your life. Live functionized. Which brings us to the topic of the day, the game changers. Just like the Fit Lab, which is a game changer, there is a movie out on Netflix Mm -hmm. called The Game Changers. And we wanted to talk about it because... It's been making a big deal. You see all across social media, there's big names that both were promoting it and in it. You know, small name drops, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jackie Chan. And everyone keeps coming in to functionize to literally talk about it and asking all these questions. And Mm -hmm. I wanted to put the questions to rest after all this time because, no offense, I love you all, but stop asking questions. (laughs) (laughs) Here's the answers. So just listen to this and you get all the answers. There you go. Well, for those who have not seen or heard about, let's give a quick little synopsis of what it is. So other than just a documentary movie on Netflix, it follows James Wilkes. He is the narrator. He's also an ex-MMA fighter. He won the Ultimate Fighter on a TV show. The idea or the story was that he went ahead to do all of his research, figure out what ways were the best way to recover from said injury. And he came across the concept of a high vegetarian-based diet, but they would not use the word veganism too often. Exactly. He kind of went almost forks over knives in this one. And he kind of brought up the idea of there was a study on Roman gladiators. The only problem is that it wasn't really a study at all. Is that the only problem? Well... (laughs) I'm not Sorry, here. I'm, I'm not here to bash the movie. The opening was awesome. Oh, it really was. It really it, pulled it, you in. It pulled me in. I was excited for it. I liked it a lot. Um, the idea of a study, there there's steps that have to be done to actually make it a study, and just observing some bones later on is not exactly a study. Yes, Roman gladiators did consist primarily, it seems, of wheat, uh, barley. However, that's not a study. So we don't know what else they were doing as well. They may have eaten meat, 
They may not have eaten meat, but most likely they may have had some meat from time to time because even in Roman times, the gladiators were invited to the big galas, if you would. Mm-hmm. And I mean, as everyone thinks, the gladiators are these big, ripped guys. Let's throw in a little curveball in here for later down the road. They were actually usually quite fat. And mm-hmm. the main reason was it was an extra layer of cushion. You get stabbed in the gut, not like anyone wants to, but they could keep moving right. as opposed to puncture an organ. So just to get the idea of it's not what we depict of it's as It's not like in the show Spartacus. Correct. Where everybody is just like <laughs> jacked nope. to the core core, right? So, I mean, it does appear these guys ate mostly vegetarian-based diets, but we also don't know that. Before we get into the studies, I just want to talk about the background of every study and biggest thing is bias. When I go through a study and do a critical appraisal, I gotta look for bias. If there's bias, the study literally gets thrown out right then and there. Mm-hmm. Because, well, if it's biased, if I do a study that's biased, I'm gonna prove what I want to see. Mm-hmm. This all is day where, long. This is where everyone's like, oh, you can find anything you want in research studies, especially when it comes to nutrition. Protein's good, protein's bad, this is good, this is bad. It's usually a form of bias. Who is doing it and why? A lot of people go out there with studies to try to prove a certain point or in films in this matter, and you know they do a good job with it. Mm-hmm. So as you said, you have to root out the bias, make sure it's a fair, well done study. You got your gold standard, you know, double blind, controlled study. Right. Meaning that you're not comparing it to nothing. You have, if you wanna make this bone study a full study, it would compare these bones of gladiators to like bones of non-gladiators or bones of more recent times, something to compare to other than just showing, this is what we found. Because otherwise so many assumptions to be built off. Of. Absolutely. You know, this movie, though, was a Titanic movie. It's epic proportions, and I say that as a very intended pun. The main producer behind it, funder, was James Cameron and his wife, Susie. James Cameron, as many know, he was the guy behind Titanic and and Avatar. Avatar. Love that. Both phenomenal movies, right? Mm -hmm. However, they also founded Verdient Foods, which produces organic pea protein. And it wants to become the actual number one organic pea protein company in all of North America. And that was stated, actually, by James Cameron in 2017. And $140 million was actually invested um, with Ingredient, which is one of the leading global suppliers. So there is some big backing in this movie. uh, Plant-based company. Right, they're a plant-based company. There's a financial incentive to pushing out certain types of information. Huge. And i got to say, their website is amazing. Oh, it was great. It, it looks side. cool. <laughs> the trail, it was Hollywood quality. Mm-hmm. So expect nothing less. Yeah, Hollywood producers, Hollywood actors. Yeah, even That's here cool. in Jersey, you had John Stewart, who was leading up the um, talk. There was a sh- viewing of it, and John Stewart held a open conversation on it. And a lot of individuals showed up. It mm-hmm. was a big deal, and it is a big deal. And that's why we're here, obviously, because we just wanted to talk about the big deal in a more scientificish way. So let's talk about it. All right, let's have a crap ton good of time here. <laughs> Gotta throw it in. Sure, I'm sure we'll come <laughs> back to it. So where do you wanna start? There's a lot of different topics or subcategories that were based put on this film, anywhere from individual athletes to full sports. Sure, a lot of what was done here is small sample size or even case studies. Yeah, anecdotal stories was a lot of them. You know, one person saying, I changed my life in this way, and they mentioned one way. Mm-hmm. And look what everything happened. I start. I dropped meat. I ate a vegetarian-based diet, and we can go through some of these about the different changes that happened. But let's note they didn't talk about any of the other changes, which we'll get into that in a couple of seconds. We'll get into the, your MMA in a moment because I. Oh, I'm gonna. Let's yeah. talk about testosterone first, because when we watch UFC, there's just a testosterone rush, primal, mm. just carnal. Watch. Let's ah. just destroy, cut someone's head off with your bare hands. Exactly. Love it. So in the movie, they talked about a 2000 study uh, talking about cow's milk and how it lowers testosterone. Yes. In this, they only used 18 actual individuals. Yep, and not even half of them were men. Correct. Only seven were men, mm-hmm. six kids, five females. So already we've got to wipe out half of this here. And part of a well-done study, let you guys know, I mean, there are always pilot studies. The first time you do a study on a topic, they're usually small sample sizes, but that just suggests things. With something this small, seven men on a testosterone study is almost insignificant. I mean, it's very small. Right, we're just seeing, does it, in this case, does it lower testosterone in men? Mm-hmm. And that, that's pretty much all it did. And even more so, it was testosterone secretions, not actually, I mean, the way they checked it, it wasn't full-blown testosterone. Exactly. And 
It, it did lower testosterone secretions. For two hours. <laughs> two hours, very temporarily. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if they check it four hours later, there was no change in testosterone levels. Correct. So, I mean, you got kind of have to extrapolate little details in there when you say, oh, it lowered testosterone. It didn't directly lower it and only lowered it for a short period of time. And it was only on average of seven men. Correct. It, right, two hours. And it also increased uh, sex hormone binding globulins here. Mm -hmm. And which is shown that the usable testosterone is actually equal to this. So this is really, it doesn't really tell me anything. I mean, if you watch, I bet you if I watch Titanic, my testosterone goes right down. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> for about two hours, and then okay. it recovers, right? <laughs> Only if you're drinking cow's milk with it, I'll support it. <laughs> All right. Oh, I will add on to that, the cow's milk that they got, I thought this was interesting, that was pregnant cows only. They specifically targeted pregnant cows, so, so there's higher, higher hormone levels uh -huh. and everything uh -huh. involved. So there was a lot of bias put into this. Or even not even bias, maybe it was just missing factors. I don't really know which one it was, but it comes out to not exactly being the results that it was promoted to be. So let's get in a little bit about the UFC, shall we? Because I know you've been dying to talk about this. I want to talk about avocados, but we can talk about UFC first. I do love avocados. UFC. Okay, fine. So there was a big part in this where they talked about uh, you know small name drop again. Conor McGregor. He's probably not probably he likely is the most famous UFC fighter out there. He doesn't yeah. just win the fight. He picks the round, right? He did for a while, and he was very good. He knocked people out left and right. Mm -hmm. Almost all of his victories were knockouts. What round was he supposed to knock Mayweather out in though? I don't remember what he vowed. I want to say two, just because he always picks. It must two. have been meat that he ate too much of. But let's go. <laughs> what happened? All right, so. so the big thing, the build up to this in terms of what the game changer showed mm -hmm. is that so Conor McGregor won the best all one of the best fighters out there, and to be honest, I was never a fan. I just wasn't. But he went up against this guy named Nate Diaz. Diaz is known to be for the most part a vegetarian. Right. I mean, he's been known this for years, his older brother was, his and he does side note, he does eat eggs, chicken and stuff, at least that's what he says when he's not in training camp. And then he goes pure vegan. So, spoiler, if you didn't know what happened a couple years ago, is McGregor fought Diaz. Diaz came in on short notice. I think it was about 11 days. Mm -hmm. Connor was going to fight at 155 pounds. The change two weeks out was to jump up to 170. That's a little bit of a detail we'll come back to. So, Connor McGregor fought Diaz, and Diaz won by submission. Finished it pretty quickly in the second round. What they showed in the documentary is Conor McGregor going on about how he ate pretty much his weight and steak every day. I mean, it was pretty much the message it got across, and he was right. very straight about it. And He was kind of talking like a big badass, though. He was. Like, he, just, uh, he does that. He you know, walks in around uh -huh. and shows off his stuff. And then you know, it was like, oh, he lost. And he talked about how he was a problem of energy. He didn't conserve energy right. He didn't feel like he had the energy. He fatigued too quickly. And... He's the carnivore. You look over at Nate Diaz, who is known for his cardio. I mean, that's what he's known for. So it's a vegetarian lifestyle. That's what it was pushed. Right. Directly. Side notes, hidden things. One, Nate Diaz, for fun, does triathlons. So he is always in shape, no matter if he's fighting or not fighting. So he's just not going to tire out. No, it's yeah. what he's known <laughs> for. He does... He does what I'll call it a pitter patter. He's a number cruncher when it comes to fighting. He will hit you 200 times and eventually you drop. Conor McGregor's known to knock people out in one punch. He went up a weight class to a larger opponent than what he's used to, and he tried to knock Nate Diaz out. He missed a lot with very high energy kicks, punches, big energy movements. They didn't show you this in the film. They actually changed the whole conversation around where when McGregor was talking about he didn't have the energy for it right after eating all the steak, those were about a month apart of those conversations, or at least two or three weeks. He was just talking about how he's gassed out because he didn't fight intelligently. That was not put into it. What he said was kind of skewed with timing to make it seem like it was all because he ate a bunch of meat. And that was irrelevant because he was, at that point, I believe 14 and 1 or something like that. He had not lost in the UFC yet. He was knocking people out left and right. And they just happened his first loss was against someone who's known to be a vegan. Mm -hmm. And so it must be the veganism, the high vegetarian diet that caused Nate Diaz to win. When you had McGregor who had one loss on his record and Nate Diaz who had about 10 or 12. I mean, things that they don't show. I mean, you have to try to promote what you're trying careful to get. Careful editing. Yes. Pretty much. Very careful editing. 
So it came down to the whole idea of trying to push this whole 10 minute segment of the meat eater had much less energy than the vegetarian. Though that was true, it seems completely unrelated. Right. It was just the tactic. And then McGregor did actually, they fought a second time. Mm -hmm. He They went all five rounds and McGregor actually won it. He completely changed the way he fought. He didn't throw major spinning kicks and jump punches. So he watched some film, figured out what was he going on. He conserved his energy hmm. while still eating a bunch of steak. Weird. Yeah, I don't know. And so the steak eater won. Steak eater won. And I'm not here to promote meat eating as the no. ultimate end all. I'm just saying the guy ate meat and he, he won. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of high-level athletes that are vegetarian or vegan and a lot that are heavy meat eaters. It comes down a lot of personal choice and then personal genetics, which you've, if you listen to any of our podcasts, we have gone to what, a lot. A lot, a lot. <laughs> Just hit search and type in some words. Yeah. And it'll probably <laughs> pop up over the past couple of years, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it really didn't show in any true way that – any one diet in this case helped out with the energy it was who fought more intelligent than one. Mm -hmm. Great. And then, you know, it's, again, there's a lot of big veget. It's what else did they eat or supplement outside the carnivorous diet or vegetarian diet? You have someone like TJ Dillashaw, also very well known for his cardio. He is a huge ketogenic fan. Mm -hmm. He also was busted for having I was EPO. Saying he's also a big EPO <laughs> fan as well. Just <laughs> so, I mean, who so knows what else is there's going the, the system? Key. EPO and keto. They both end in O, so therefore, you have endurance. Is he O positive as well? Isn't that a heavy meat-eating uh, blood type? It is. It is. <laughs> oh, wow, there might be some uh, deep conspiracy here. We'll see if Dr. Dadamo knows this, anything about that. Uh, All right, let's talk about some cancer. Yeah, because otherwise we're going to tangent off. Go ahead. Let's talk <laughs> cancer. So it, it, the movie does go into and uh, states that animal products cause colon cancer. Well, it's kind of a half-truth okay. on that one. Actually, it's colorectal cancer. We all have a 5% on average risk of colorectal cancer. Mm -hmm. Eating 50 grams of processed meat every day actually is going to increase our colorectal cancer risk by around 17%, which is actually relative. The actual increase is really 1%, so the total with an absolute risk is 6%. So really by eating processed meat, the type of meat that is going to most likely increase your risk relatively, absolutely, is really only doing it by 1%. So going from 5%, which regardless you're going to have, mm -hmm. you're really only increasing by 1%. So yep, truth, it does increase the risk of cancer. How much? And that's if you're gorging yourself on processed meats. Yeah, hot dogs and Big Macs every day. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's another thing that uh, needs to be identified is the type of food source. I mean, it's pretty well thought about, you know, like produce is organic or non-organic. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've gone over that a few times again, the differences of it. And it was, I don't, I don't recall if that was actually pointed out in the uh, film or not. But then meat sources are the same way. There's a lot of different levels of quality of Huge meat. different quality. You a hot dog versus organic grass-fed beef is far different. And grass-fed. And grass-fed. I did not have that one. I apologize. You, you forgot the end. Oh. <laughs> end grass fed. All right, here we go. Yep. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. It is quality. I mean, you can have awful quality produce. You, mm -hmm. I mean, you think you, your fruits and vegetables should really be vegetables and fruits. We'll just go ABC order on that one. Glycemic index. Oh. But the quality, I mean, if you're having something that's been sprayed with Roundup, you know, I can have all the celery in the world sprayed with Roundup. I'm getting cancer. Most likely it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's kind of been proven. However, if I'm having end grass-fed meat, my risk of cancer most likely is going to be lower than eating that celery. So does that mean that now all of a sudden i got to eat meat and I won't get cancer? If I eat celery, I will. Celery now causes cancer, apparently. <laughs> it's all the quality of the source. Right. Um, uh, it's even as we were talking at Healthy Happy Hour uh, the other week about the organic proteins versus non-organic proteins and how organic proteins have less pesticides, far less pesticides in them than organic or non-organic proteins. However, the organic proteins have far higher heavy metals in there. Yep, so pick your poison. Half and half? Half organic, half, half organic. organic. Half organic, <laughs> I mean, so it, it's, half organic. Half a very Big difficult. Mac and half a uh, and grass-fed hormone free steak. So we do our absolute best, and that's mm -hmm. really what we're trying to do every single day, no matter what. 
by Living Functionized is doing our best and giving our best in everything that we do. We mm -hmm. take the best information that we have and yeah, we literally we do our best about it. And we were talking a little bit before about some avocados and that was kind of for a lead in. Yes. It's again, inflammation and meat. But that study was funded by Haas Avocado. Yeah. We gotta throw that study out. But that was really drilled upon in the movie. Yeah, what was interesting is in the movie they pushed it as they didn't you know, they talked about avocado, but they didn't specify that. They kind of generalized it being all produce is equal to avocado. Mm -hmm. I mean they really I mean that's what they were pushing for. It. And really what the study showed, I mean, it did look to be a well-done study, as biased it was by the avocado industry. It did appear to show well that avocados do help with inflammatory uh, modulators when you're eating meat. That's right. great. So eat avocados when you eat meat. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good I mean, lead in the there <laughs> because it does also talk about the smoked and processed meats. Yes. They are very heterocyclic. Well, they have a lot of heterocyclic amines in them, which are known to cause cancer. Mm -hmm. But mixing them with a nice marinade, a yogurt marinade, uh, yep, or a vinegar, is going to greatly reduce these in it, and thus reducing the risk of cancer. Mm -hmm. So, just eat right. <laughs> That's oh, kind of going to be the I'm, message I'm here. It, the you ruined ending. the big hot idea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just, just eat right. Okay. They did a study on their right, study. Uh, it's not really a study. They did an observation on blood testing. Uh, was this the centrifuge one? Yeah, they did the centrifuge. Some was cloudy, some was not cloudy. Mm -hmm. They're not comparing it to their own samples, first of all, are they? No. Nope. They're literally... So, for, again, for those who didn't watch the mm -hmm. show yet, what it was, they took, I believe it was three athletes, and they were, it was either the college athletes or the football. I don't recall this one. This was one. college athletes. This was college before athletes. they uh, showed the penis. Stuff. Oh, yeah. That, that'll be another fun study to talk about. So, they gave them... Um, it was a vegan-based meal. I think these were the burritos. And yeah, one had a bean burrito, one had chicken, chicken one had beef. Yeah. And then what they did is a couple hours afterwards, they pulled the serum, the blood, mm -hmm. to see what it looked like. And they said, look, this one's very foggy, this one's very clear. Which one do you want? They didn't say anything else of what that fogginess is. I mean, that fogginess could be greatness in your blood. You don't know. It's just right. foggy. So people think that, oh, that's foggy blood. That's in me. That must be bad. Well, it, it was appears, not actually the blood. It was just the plasma. Right. <laughs> but what was going in there is, okay, what was that fogginess? Right. It appears it was, okay, floating fat. I believe that. We have fat floating around in our bloodstream. Uh, I've put fat in my bloodstream purposely with exogenous ketones. Yeah, it's, There's it's nothing a phenomenal source it. of energy, especially if you're doing something of endurance. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, long-lasting energy, and it's right there ready to use. I don't see this as being a bad thing. I don't think of it being foggy blood. It's kind of indifferent right here, and there's right. a lot of variables that are not taken into mm -hmm. account. Sleep. Are they fatigued whatsoever? Mm -hmm. um, Overtraining? What, are they on medication? What's right. alcohol content? Tobacco, which the past medical history. Mm -hmm. There's so many different things, and there are genetic predispositions even. That's they a they huge may already be one. foggy no matter what. Yeah. I don't know because there's no pre and post and no follow up. There, it just was. Here's water that's, mm -hmm. you know, I can get in the tap water if I uh, put hydrogen in it, do that alkalizing. Mm -hmm as they call it, but really it's just hydrogenating the water. You have tiny little bubbles, so the water's gonna initially look a little bit cloudy, but really that's just hydrogen bubbles in there. Yeah. I would prefer that over something totally crystal clear, which you may not know that there's tin, lead, mercury that's in there, but it's crystal clear, which one do you want? Or if you overtake many different vitamins, minerals, and supplements, your urine ends up being foggy and cloudy. Correct. And that's not a bad thing. Or with this observation study, we'll call it, Again, they took blood r pretty much right after they ate, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to what I would think would be a better marker. This again, this is personal opinion, is if they just take the blood. Let's say fasting. If someone is, they had someone that was already vegetarian, I believe. Mm -hmm. So compare his blood of what he's been doing for the last, I don't know, five, ten years, wherever he's been vegan, and compare it to the guy who's been meat eating. Right. Because that would be the whole of what's been happening in their life of the diet. And if it's the same, again, how much does it matter? Mm -hmm. We don't really know. Foggy blood, not foggy blood. <laughs> and that was the whole selling point, to try to shock or scare you without really yeah, knowing what it was. That's what it was, was just a scare tactic. Uh -huh. uh, they talked about how iceberg lettuce has far more antioxidants than does salmon. And eggs, and yeah, this was one and of the... And eggs, and you know what? You're right with the nutritional value, though, I got to say... Iceberg lettuce is mostly crunchy water. Uh-huh. And then, again, they made a point, has more antioxidants than salmon and eggs. Okay. Nutrient dense eggs is one of the most nutrient dense foods out there. Yep, I mean, it's got stuff that you can't get in most other food 
iceberg lettuce, such, and, you know, choline's the big Choline's the, the number, a number one that you're looking for in that um, one. The omega-3 content that you're going to get in salmon, though, compared to iceberg lettuce is, if you're talking about... any in iceberg right. lettuce. I didn't look, so I don't know. <laughs> if you're looking for a anti-inflammatory diet, I want to personally include salmon, not iceberg lettuce. Yes, 100%. Just putting that out there. So right. now if we're making a movie, it, we're going to be calling it Fish Over Forks. Am I get, I'm getting too sarcastic. I'm supposed to be <laughs> non-biased right now. It was just a silly statement. I mean, you I would know, expect more from the We're using the scientific makers of the movie facts, there. so for the most part, this is unbiased. Sarcasm aside. <laughs> Which, again, if anyone's listening to our podcast, this is nothing new. Yeah. <laughs> we thrive better, I think, on not eating junk food. Personally, I think eating junk food, candy, cookies every single day, our cells aren't going to perform to the peak. All right, you got to eat clean, right? Bro. So if you start adding vegetables to a diet filled with coffee, candy, cigarettes, gum, mm -hmm. et cetera, yada, yada, you're probably going to perform better, aren't you? You should. Right. Because you're getting good nutrients that you didn't have before. If you went from eating 10 Twinkies a day to 10 Twinkies and 10 pieces of celery that weren't all pesticide ridden, you mm -hmm. are going to feel better just because you get nutrients that you didn't have before. It's like a metabolic restart kit that you may get. They, they, some call it detox, and it's called that literally because your body's getting nutrients that it has not had before. Your body's able to function at a far higher level than it ever has before. And that's simply because you're getting those nutrients. And yes, I fully 100% concur, vegetables have nutrients. They have phytonutrients, they have vitamins, they've got minerals. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a myriad of positive benefits to produce. Yep. And on the flip side is, so does meat. And they have different ones. It's like they can pair and match what, so well together. <laughs> OK, there's my sarcasm coming up, but true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the big knocks against meat is, believe it or not, protein. Saying that vegetables have protein in it. You know, pea protein. Mm -hmm. Delicious sand. You know, you get hemp protein. I, I only have, I'm saying it's delicious sand because Shantae has converted to pea protein after getting her most recent labs back and whey is causing the IgG pro-inflammatory reaction. So trying to find something new. And I have now inherited unflavored organic pea protein. It's delicious sand. Yeah, just saying. But they discuss, I mean, the idea of a protein is having complete amino acids. Correct. Rice protein versus chicken protein versus whey. Let's do a little comparison. Let's do. <laughs> so there's something called the protein digestibility corrected amino acid score. PDCAAs. It sounds like something you get for holding a girl's hand in high school. Just saying. So a perfect score is a 1.0. That actually consists of eggs, um, milk, whey, which is part of milk, milk, if you would, the whey and casein. Beef is at a 0 0.92. Now, we want to start getting the vegetarian sources, the top vegetarian sources, 0 0.54 kidney beans. That's a far cry. It's almost half as much of a complete amino acid score. Mm -hmm. You go down to 0 0.52 is peanuts. So you are getting technically proteins. They're not as complete, though. Right. So therefore, the bioavailability, how much you're actually absorbing, is far less than you would be from a meat source. Mm -hmm. And that's why they talk about protein matching with different veggies. Mm -hmm. And um, well, actually. There, I was just saying, along with that is what's called an anti-nutrient. So with anti-nutrients, it's actually found in peas, uh, fava beans, chickpeas, which i got to say, Yun, if you're listening, keep making those uh, hot sauce Ooh, chickpeas, roasted, chickpeas. roasted chickpeas. chickpeas. Amazing. Those are so good. Oh, yes. We, nice. we, we've tried since, <laughs> and uh, Yun, we miss you. We miss you. Come home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they interfere with the absorption of the amino acids. So even though that you are actually getting a protein, you're not getting as much. It's just not absorbing as much. So when you're trying to recover, and not necessarily recovering from a workout, just from damage of every day, 
the movement, the, the stress put on you, your cells need to recover and replicate every single day. And protein is what does mm -hmm. it. You gotta get the right types and nourish yourself the proper way. So a big part of, in the film of this, was talking about the quality of proteins is, is the vegetable protein equal to meat protein, which we're kind of already said for the most part, it's not because right. they're not complete proteins. Even with birth weight, uh, mm -hmm. baby's birth weight is actually much lower been shown from women who are eating a plant-based protein source throughout their pregnancy, especially in the last trimester, as opposed to women who have a meat, especially even milk protein. Um, animal protein, higher amounts, as even shows to stave off sarcopenia in elderly, as opposed to a plant-based protein, which does not. So therefore, incorporating more of a animal source protein, it can be in a powder form, um, combined with resistance training, is going to stave off sarcopenia, increase bone density, therefore reduce uh, osteopenia, osteoporosis in elderly individuals. It's a win-win. I want to have a half argument until I change my opinion partway through this. So in the actual, <laughs> in the documentary, uh, they did cite what actually I thought was, I, w I went through a lot of the studies that they s cited. Mm -hmm. They threw a lot of them up very quickly. They pretty much shotgunned them up at a certain yeah, point, like bang, five bang, of them bang, up, bang, boom, boom, exactly. boom. And one of them was actually really well done. It was a fully peer-reviewed article, and they mentioned directly from it, saying that and when it comes to gaining strength and muscle mass, research comparing plant and animal proteins show that as long as the proper amount of amino acids, that amino acid profile, are consumed, the source is irrelevant. Okay, this was a well done study, I believe it. What they didn't mention is the five big takeaways, that was one of the five big takeaways. The other ones were as a group, vegetarians have lower mean muscle creatine concentrations than do omnivores, which may affect supermaximal exercise performance. Hmm. Sorry, taking that back. So they would bit. then have to start supplementing with creatine. And then well-planned, appropriately supplemented vegetarian diets appear to effectively support athletic performance. The emphasis appropriately supplemented. So again, this was all coming from the same study. And then also vegetarians, particularly women, are at increased risk for non-anemic iron deficiency, which comes into a huge problem with endurance. Correct. So I mean, like in the B12. And that's the way that they started. Uh, the documentary started was talking about the endurance gains. This is even how we started talking about this was the endurance gains of vegetarian diet. And again, it comes down to they were supplementing with something. Mm -hmm. They have to be. EPO. I mean, it's possible. It's very possible. <laughs> I mean, some of these guys. Um, the one was the record for the Appalachian Trail. Yes, Steve uh, Jerk. Yes, who yep. he ended up you know, talking about how great it is for healing recovery, and then he tore his quad pretty early into it. Correct. Um, so that kind of just nixes that one. I mean, anyone right can there. get hurt. I mean, it, it happens. I mean, it's kind of irrelevant, I guess. But then on the flip side, there was the guy, I uh, have his name written somewhere, but his last name I think was Britt. He had the uh, record for 100-mile American runner. Yes. And he's full keto. Yes. So which one is the endurance, or is it just the athlete, or? It's probably the athlete in that case. <laughs> yeah, it just likely saying. is. I mean, I think it is in a lot of cases. I mean, diet makes a huge difference in the way you perform, but it has to be a well-balanced diet, especially if it's targeted towards the individual. Because, again, every body is different. They want different needs. Mm -hmm. But there's generalizations like you want all your vitamins and minerals your body needs to work well. You know, one thing that was kind of thrown out there and emphasized was how you can get all your protein, three, what was it, three ounces of meat or eggs oh, yeah. and in then one peanut butter sandwich. Well, they were right. They, mm -hmm. I mean, they were right. They, they straight up were right. Uh, five tablespoons of peanut butter does equal three ounces of beef for three large eggs. So that's also 500 calories sans bread. So if you're going to put bread on that as well, we're talking to like 700 calories right there. Um, so if we're talking about, and a lot of people really are watching this movie here, not for extreme performances as high elite athletes. Right. They really just want to look and feel good, which means decreased body fat. Mm -hmm. 700 calories for a peanut butter sandwich to get the same amount of protein in a teeny meeny morsel of beef or three eggs about 300 calories or less yeah 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 not quite equal no it's what 180 I mean, calories in those three eggs big yeah, difference roughly so i mean much different mm -hmm. 
And then uh, oh, excuse me, there was another one on that one that I uh, I, I did have to look up. I was curious. Oh. It's also equivalent to nineteen cups of spinach. So if you'd like to have nineteen cups of spinach, that's a crap ton of spinach. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot. You of can be Popeye. <laughs> What if you had 19 cups of spinach with three ounces of beef? You'd be full. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you want me to say. No, I wouldn't. One. No, I would not. We're at 10 minutes. Mm, going back to the hummus. Sorry. I know, pre recording conversations. But, ooh, which study do you want to go to next? Uh, Dr. Ornish? Sure. Sure. So, Dr. Dean Ornish, who has pretty much stated and kind of shown his research there, uh, a lot of case studies that he's done, is that those who have heart problems have a vegetarian diet, clear up the arteries. Mm -hmm. That's what he says. Um, people, he says people who eat an uh, increased amount of animal protein have a 400 500% increased risk of death from various forms of cancer and type 2 diabetes. The problem, however, is the diabetes mellitus, just say diabetes. I, I know. Will for Brim. Diabetes. Uh, it goes beyond protein, and carbs are actually far more important in this. It's not the protein that's causing the cancer. The amount of protein that you need to significantly increase your insulin and keep it flowing around the body the same way that sugar does is tremendous. So, in fact, we're now starting to talk about high carb versus low carb because, let's face it, I saw one of the individuals that we see regularly posting on their Instagram account, going into a vegan bakery today and being very happy that that individual could eat anything they wanted now because they found a vegan bakery. It is chock full of sugar. Mm -hmm. Very high carbohydrate. And that's what happens with a lot of vegans is they, unless you are truly happy on, I'm going back to celery because I like the celery and hummus, is that, jail. <laughs> <laughs> is that these diets are very high carbohydrate and it's a very high glycemic carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. Thus, if you're diabetic, you don't want high glycemic carbohydrates in the first place. I mean, if you eat just a bunch of pure vegetables, you're going to have the high fiber and, but how many, you don't see that too much with vegetarians or really in, anyone in general, because you can't, you need more calories than that. <laughs> right, you know, getting past mm -hmm. the diabetes, having it under control, uh, research does show that and emphasizes that it's the unrefined carbohydrates, which is high fiber carbs, low sugar, have your mono polyunsaturated fats, and even now more people are starting to understand the saturated fats and the benefits of that, mm -hmm. is going to help correct diseases such as diabetes and help start to reverse and get you off that medication. Not having more vegan foods, which are really very highly processed. It's really just having more vegetables and it doesn't need to be just vegetables there's been a lot of studies again showing I mean, there's been a lot of these where it takes okay you're on a high vegetarian diet and then you're on basically just a meat diet mm -hmm. and the people that are eating just meat have all kinds of health issues the key is they were eating just meat not to say that the people who eat just vegetables don't have health issues anemia is one of the big ones it's when you add vegetables to meat you get all the same results too again as long as it's high quality food both the produce Correct. and the meat I mean, we were talking earlier today in the lab about the Inuit Indians who eat yep. a whale crap blubber. ton of whale blubber and meat. They don't have any they, vegetables. They straight up just slurp it down. Right. And their risk of heart attack, cardiovascular disease. It's like is the lowest out there. Right. No vegetables. But the quality of what they're getting. High quality blubber. That is correct. I mean, it's working. I mean, 100%. There's actually a study, not an Inuit study, uh, in the Journal of Nutrition and Metabolism and it kind of showed how there is a, um, it, it's talking about the levels of carbohydrates versus um, glycemic. So we're talking about here a 20% carb versus a 50% carb diet. Um, that the 20% carbohydrate diet did far better than the 50% carbohydrate diet when we're talking about insulin control, glycemic okay. control. Makes so, sense. Correct. <laughs> so it's, yes, have the carbs. I'm not against carbs. Mm -hmm. You need the carbs. Have the low glycemic carbs, but doesn't necessarily mean that low glycemic carbs on the whole and consisting of a diet of low glycemic carbs is the solution either. 
there's a lot of balance to be had, which is really the main key point to be made here. Uh, on this, Jim, it's your job to make sure I don't rant too much on this one. This is one thing that, for the most part, everything that was shown in this documentary, they were at least based on some truths, so even if it was skewed a little bit to push the message they wanted. You know, they did a great job with that. Mm -hmm. One thing that I'm going to just straight up and disagree with is they verbatim said that your brain needs sugar, and it's the only thing that your brain works on. They, yeah, they said brain needs sugar. They didn't mm -hmm. say glucose. Correct. And they didn't say that it also works on ketone bodies. No, um, and what happens is when you don't have carbohydrates, sugar, or you're in a fasting state, your brain very quickly and very easily switches to beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is mm -hmm. a ketone or a fat. Yes. So was, that one just kind of like, you know, made me like jolt around a little bit when I heard that one, is that, yeah, your brain does use glucose. It is its typical preferred method, mm -hmm. but it's got a great backup and a longer lasting energy of a fat-based metabolite. Correct. And I know everyone's been waiting for us to talk about penises. So, is that what everyone's been waiting for? Oh, we did that <laughs> podcast, believe it or not, which is still one of our top That's five. True. And we did that. The penis podcast. That was literally, like, we ago? were sitting around and we didn't know what to talk about that day. And we're I, why did we pick that topic? I don't know. But we're sitting around having to get a podcast out and said, let's talk about penises and how to increase the, the size of it. So, mm -hmm. uh, and that happened, was our and most still listened show. Yeah. Exactly. So, so we're going to talk about vegetarianism. I, I guess penises were just inevitable. Th they took a couple guys on, um, was it the Dolphins, I think it was, and. Endothelial function is a predictor of heart disease. Fact. So they decided to compare Popeye's food versus being vegan. Let's see who actually has better penis function. Guess what? Popeye's chicken is not going to be the uh, <laughs> the alpha male. <laughs> you know, I don't think it was the Popeye's versus veganism. No. So the way they ended up doing this study was a sleep study. They had some large contra contraption like taped to their thigh. Yeah. Which kind of brings me to a little bit more of the bias I had in this one is the first night they fell asleep, they had, you know, meat, Popeye chicken. And they measured, okay, how many times did they get erections, how long they last, and how large were they in their sleep? Mm -hmm. That was the first night when they were trying to adapt or get used to this giant thing taped to their leg. The second night, when presumably be a little bit more comfortable, they had a vegetarian based diet and everything worked out better. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you had a high quality food against a noticeably less quality food. Right. Yeah, th th I would expect those results. I'm not quite sure. I don't think they even stated specifically what was eaten. I don't think they did. I mean, I can have some beets and uh, get some nitrous oxide and oh, be yeah, a little more stud on that one. That'll work. <laughs> yeah. You know? Uh, anything to vasodilate will work in that case. Yeah, right. I mean, if they would have had a bunch of spinach or anything that had like a that moss builder, that is going to increase more. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, that's basically what it does, or a high niacin. So, yeah, without knowing what it was in there, you could, I mean, we could have easily skewed it the other way around the right. same way. I mean, there's another study that shows after four weeks, not just a few nights, but actually four weeks of having milk, pea, and egg protein blended together, that endothelial function was actually greatly improved. So it's kind of going back to the idea of have your peas and your eggs too? It's a stretch. It, it is a stretch. But the idea is it's not necessarily one versus the other. It's not let's go keto mm -hmm. or let's go being a 100% vegetarian. And that's really the big take on at least what I figure of what we're talking about on this against what the uh, show showed was it was all pushing. They kept saying a high vegetable diet or vegetable-based li vegetable. lifestyle when really, yeah, they're just talking about veganism or being a vegan. Um but it's not necessarily saying that's the best thing. They pulled parts of different studies out, but it does show, yeah, eating a lot of vegetables helps. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you have to throw away the meat. Same thing with meat is great. You want to eat your vegetables too. You right. shouldn't be on a whole carnivorous diet. We talked about keto so many times, and a lot of people, that's usually the biggest problem I know is people who go on a high-fat diet is they don't eat enough produce, and that's usually when they start getting a few issues. Right, and usually when they go on a keto diet, there, most people are trying to lose weight. Mm -hmm. And the research has kind of come out and been proven, even Mr. Keto of what, three, four years there, I wasn't doing it to lose weight, I was doing it to improve endurance, mm -hmm. have my brain work better. It was kind of a little experiment. I liked it. But it's, you're gonna lose weight regardless. 
if you are all keto or all vegetarian based on nutrients and a lot of it has to do with calories. It's the mm -hmm. type of nutrient, it's the type of food on playing with your hormones. That's where the fun biohacking, the fit lab stuff that we kind of do comes into play. Really keying in and honing in. And people I know are going to be even more confused now. Oh, I thought I was supposed to eat all vegetables. That was a game changer. Oh, I'm supposed to be all keto. That's a game changer. I like to say, if you ain't testing, you're guessing, always test for success. Get your labs done. Mm -hmm. Know it creates a pro-inflammatory reaction. Perhaps beef comes up. Perhaps it's eggs that come up. Perhaps it's chicken per cap comes up. Maybe it's spinach and arugula. Exactly. That very well could mm -hmm. come up too. So if it's spinach and arugula, guess what? You're not eating those, are you? You're going to find some other vegetable or some other meat. You know, what is going to keep your body healthy? We are designed as omnivores. That's how we're designed. Our physiology works only one way. We can tweak it. We are that little chemistry set, but it is what it is. So all one size does not fit all. Keto was designed to treat epilepsy. Yes. I mean, that is to throw back real quickly to the uh, brain needs the car part is ever since like the 80s or a little prior, it's been sh very well shown that high fat diets are great neurologically. Mm -hmm. I and mean, it's what really, yeah, the swank diet, I think, was the first one, which is very similar to keto diets, high fat. It's great for neurological issues. You know, as like a medical diet, so to speak. Right. Multiple sclerosis, seizures, any of that stuff. Yeah, it concussion. Works very well. It's good for a couple weeks. Huge, Go yes. keto on that. So that way, you know, your brain is starving for nutrients, and but the excess glucose is going to oxidize and thus cause more damage. Mm -hmm. So let it feed on ketones and heal for a little while. The one size doesn't fit all, and now it's, like I said, it kind of goes from high carb versus low carb to the extreme once again. And I guess it's selling a lot of books, it's selling a lot of views, mm -hmm. and, well, mission accomplished for the producers of it. They did a good job on that aspect. Yep. So it's up to individuals like us here on the podcast to at least get the education out there so individuals aren't totally confused because most likely there's going to see another documentary and they're going to be confused even more. Yep. And uh, you mentioned, Jim, how we are omnivores, which we haven't used that word yet today, but it's a big deal because a lot in that film and really just talking to people and diet throughout my education, you know, a lot of comes up saying, oh, we should be herbivores. And th there's a lot of um, proof about showing that we're supposed to be herbivores. Things like we have a longer digestive tract that I believe was pointed out in the show compared mm -hmm. to most carnivores. And they looked at the teeth profile of humans showing that they're more for chewing plants than meat. And they kept comparing it to most other carnivores. Okay, you look on the flip side, compare our digestive tract and teeth to herbivores, we're not like them either. We are a mix in there. Correct. I mean, we do have a longer digestive tract than a lion but not even close to an ape or a cow that goes, you know, has to break down the plant in four different stomachs. That's correct. So, I mean, it is what that suggests to me, at least, is that we were evolving from being a more herbivore based because like apes, most of the primates are more herbivore. And we went a different route and started becoming a little bit more carnivorous since omnivore. Mm -hmm. But even on that, I've animals that you think are herbivores really aren't completely like, I don't know if you knew, but deer actually are known to eat birds and bird eggs that are resting. And deer are known of, you know, you think of, they just eat plants. Right. They will eat meat if it's there and available without really much hesitation. That's very common in the animal world. Like what we were. If we were looking for meat, we literally, we hunted and gathered and we mm -hmm. looked for meat. When we found meat, we ate well. When we didn't, we scavenged on vegetation. Yeah, and the big thing was looking for high calorie meat. Uh, and that's, again, normal in all of the animal kingdom is... Let's go back to the lion, king of the jungle, which very carnivorous. They would always go after, they don't go after the small little animals. They go after the big fat ones. Right. <laughs> and there's reasons for that. Very nutrient dense. Exactly. Uh, not to say that we're lions, but again, it's all animals, all species look for what we need. Mm -hmm. Happens to be nutrient dense. Fat is a good thing. Absolutely. So what do you say we wrap this up for today and tell everybody when you have questions, just hit the repeat button. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Feel free to DM us anytime yes. at Functionized, F-U-N-C-T-I-O-N-I-S-E-D. Visit the website, www.functionized.com. 
Also find us on Instagram or Facebook, same thing, hashtag functionized. Direct message us, ask us any of these questions. Maybe not repetitively, but ask them to us. We'll eventually answer. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to leave a five-star review. And if you haven't done so already, take a screenshot of this podcast right here, post your story, tag us at Functionized. We will follow you, like you, and even comment on you from time to time when you put cool stuff up. Has to be cool. Otherwise, we'll just ignore it. Of course. Anything else, Dr. Mike? Nah, I think I'm good. How about you, mad scientist? Anything else? Yep, i got one thing to say. And what would that be? I'm out. out. Dr. Mike, I'm out.